project, I wanted to make a riser with tall sides. So my husband used a drywall bucket. He has a lot of them. He owns a drywall company. Anyway, it was cut where the sides are about three and a half inches tall. He also sanded the outside of the bucket of the plastic to give it some tooth. But before I can begin working on it, I had to give it two spray coats of something that would bond to plastic. Now that that's done, I'm using this beautiful little stencil and I'm going to create texture around the perimeter of the little ring there. I have texture mediums, several different kinds, but for this, I'm going with the cheapest option and that is always drywall mud. It's easy to use. If you mess up, it's easy to uh, wipe it off or sand it if it's dry. To apply the mud, also called joint compound, I'm using one of my Japan scrapers that's about the width of the ring, but you know, any kind of spatula that you have, you can use. I'm not worried if it's not perfectly all the same height. Uh, in other words, some parts a little thicker than others. That's just going to give it character and also, as I said, it can be sanded, which I will be doing a little bit of that, especially when I'm about to apply, uh, after letting this dry, about to apply the second round using the stencil and troweling through it. Before I apply the stencil a second time, I am lightly sanding where uh, those half designs are at the end of the stencil. Now. This stencil does repeat, so I could have just lined it up and finished going. But the reason I did not is because I didn't want there to be a bump in the center, which might happen because it's impossible to get your texture the same height um, when matching like this. So I will overlap the stencil. That's why I'm just lightly sanding that so that one doesn't get so thick. Now the other issue, as you'll see when I start to tape the uh, stencil on, it doesn't want to necessarily go quite straight. Well, the reason that is, is because this is a drywall bucket. If you think about a bucket, it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom of the bucket. He cut this, I think, right towards the top or a little below but there is only an eighth of an inch difference in the diameter uh, from each side. However, I am going to have to adjust the stencil so that it doesn't start creeping downward. I'm getting to the end of the stencil and I can see that it's it is starting to creep a little bit um, where I don't have well it's not straight you know the same amount on each side keeping my stencil straight so I'm gonna have to adjust like that as I go along to finish this circle which is why you saw me scrape off um, a little row there so that I can continue to keep it straight I don't know how this is gonna match up when I get around because I've already kind of measured and there's going to be about, I don't know, inch and a half, two inches after I've stenciled this the third time. So we'll just see how I have to finagle to get that working. I want to explain how I've been adjusting. Um, because my spacing wasn't going to be perfect, it was going to be mismatched, so I had to start adjusting a little along. So what I was doing was working in about a three design section. And you can see right here, I'm going to pick it away, that's where the original line should have been but I scooched it up just a tiny bit 
and then troweled through. And I've been doing that this, uh, this will be the third time, I think. But I was measuring and looking. So if I place this down here where it belongs, you can see here's the line, here's where it should be. So I'm gonna scooch it up a little bit. I'm still a little off. However, you can see this line coming in, that looks pretty good. So that's how I've been adjusting. So all I have to do now to finish this up is trowel this tiny section. I've been using something a little bit smaller um, because I needed to get in right at those little points in some place and not hit the design because the design was moved. So, Now is the time to glue on my top and my bottom. My husband Randy cut these for me uh, out of eighth inch something or other. One of them is 11 and a fourth because I want this to stick out an eighth of an inch all the way around. And my measurement, the small diameter measurement is 11. The other one is 11 and 3 eighths because it's, the other side is an eighth inch bigger. So, I believe this is my 11, yeah. And that one's 11 and a quarter. So, This one first. Now I noticed when he cut, got a little bit off there. See how it's cut up? That's going to be fun to address, but I'll just fill it probably with some spackling after I get it glued down. Okay, let's talk about glues. I see a lot of people use a combination of E6000 for the permanent bond and then they'll put on top of that, uh, hot glue. I don't want to do that. Um, there have been lots of comments that I've seen on different channels that you got to be careful about mixing your glues because you can make the permanent glue fail by putting a different type of glue on top, like hot glue. I don't know if that's true. I've not tested it, but I do go to people that I trust uh, on YouTube and there is a miniature builder, the Bentley House. I think her name's 
Ara? Arya? I'm not sure. Anyway, Anna? No. Oh. She's a great little builder. She has a whole lot of subscribers, and she did a video on glues. Uh, and I printed out what she provided in the way of uh, PDFs giving advice and charts about different kinds of glues. And one interesting thing she said was that gel super glue, not liquid, but the gel super glue, put that on one side and put tacky glue on your other piece that it creates an almost instant bond. So that's what I'm gonna try here. If it doesn't work, then I'll probably go to E6000 and just weight it down and wait for 24 hours before I do the other side. Remember when using gel super glue, you need to shake it really well, which I have done, but I'll do again. And it also, they, you know, says to tap hard with the cap on so that you get the gel mixed and down into the area where it's supposed to come out. Now I'm gonna put the super glue on the plastic and the tacky glue on the wood. I'm using Eileen's clear gel tacky glue. It's been about 10 minutes, and that seems to have bonded pretty well. Can't move it or scooch it, scooch it. But you see my gap here. Now, what I've decided to do to give it extra strength, isn't this lovely? Dog hair and stuff. <laughs> This is my husband's. He had it in some container. It is a drywall mesh tape. And it's to put on drywall and then you coat over it. It, Like if you're perhaps doing a patch, I guess, or something. This gives it extra strength. If I can find where it starts. It has, um, it has a sticky back to it. Well. But it's not strong enough that it's gonna stay. So, what I'm gonna do, probably be easier to work in smaller pieces. I'm gonna cut me a strip here. I'm gonna put this on the inside and a tiny bit on this outside edge where I've got my little gap. And I want it to bond to both pieces and we're turning the circle here. So I'm gonna clip it about halfway every little bit. My husband warned me to use glue both on the base before I apply it and then glue again over the top of this and let it dry. And I'm just gonna use some tight bond quick and thick. Actually add a little water to it. Obviously, I will not be able to do this <laughs> when I put the other top on, but 
this is the one I'm kind of more worried about because of that gap.
this point in the project, it was time to remove some of the paint um, on the textured areas on the side. Well, I used a dry brush first to kind of push away a lot of that paint because remember there's a lot of paint on this side doing this technique with the mix of colors and then immediately shaking on the cornstarch. Interrupting myself by the way here, this is not my original thought using cornstarch on wet paint. I actually saw Royce Hunt do it on a pumpkin. She had painted it black and then used the cornstarch and then you lightly brush I used a mop brush. She used a soft makeup brush from Dollar Tree, but I have a mop brush, so that's what I used. And the idea here is you're just tickling the surface, tickling that cornstarch, moving it around, and trying not to get your brush into the paint. Now, back to my issue here. Three things I didn't like about using the wet distress method. Number one, it was taking absolutely forever. So I needed to find a more efficient way. The second reason I didn't like wet distressing was it seemed to be changing the paint color. Um, I had used gravel road which is a gray but it's a much more browny gray and I think the mix of paints on top of this and rubbing just changed the color of it. Thirdly, it was creating a flatness in the texture around each design and that was showing up weird to me so I switched I was like okay Janet you're a faux finisher let's just do this the way you know how to do it so I switched to using the finger brushing method um, in the paint and just kind of going over some of the areas I knew with either the wet distress or the finger painting method I was still going to have to go in and touch up because I did not want the design uh, to be that stark. So that is what I did. And then I decided, okay, well, it still needs more cornstarch back over to complete the finish on the sides. And I was thinking, well, if cornstarch wor works in wet paint, on top of wet paint, it should work on top of wet clear coat. So that's what I did. I don't want any sheen level on this entire piece, so I'm using Polyvine Dead Flat Varnish, doing the cornstarch, and letting that dry. Now all we have left to do is the top and the inlay that I will be putting on from IOD Melange. Mm -hmm.